like to uh, formally acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we're meeting today and pay our respects to elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge our guest speakers, uh, representatives from government and industry, our friends and donors of UQ, of course our UQ alumni, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. We welcome you, alumni and friends and supporters of the university, to tonight's Global Leadership Series. Since 2011, UQ has, uh, has, put, has put on over 50 of these events and they've been extraordinarily popular, not just here in Brisbane, but interstate and also overseas. Uh, so tonight, of course, we're going to hear uh, some uh, f uh, research focus around some IMB research and also hear from Karen Huss Hussey, whom I'll introduce, uh, who is the Acting Director of the Global Change Institute at UQ. So the IMB is a global leader in multidisciplinary life sciences. So what does that mean? That means that our research uh, is based on making new discoveries uh, in using life sciences, using life, to discover new things and then apply them wherever we can for the better health and wealth of the community. UQ broadly uh, is uh, ranked in the world top 20 in life sciences. It's actually an amazing achievement uh, that in the world top 20 in life sciences, there are only four non-US universities. Those are University College London, Oxford, Cambridge, University of Queensland. So, that's a, great, that's a great achievement by uh, our colleagues. It's not just IMB. Life Sciences is strong and spread right throughout the University of Queensland. Uh, as far as the IMB is concerned, our research is framed through a series of centres, one of which you'll be hearing about tonight, our uh, relatively newly created centre for, uh, for solar, I keep saying bio I keep saying biofuels, so solar biotechnology, and also centres that focus on pain, on cardiovascular disease, on uh, superbugs getting new antibiotics, uh, on the genetic basis of, of common and rare human diseases. Uh, and we also undertake research in cancer and also a centre for inflammation research. Inflammation is a big problem, of course. As I said, our discoveries are inspired by life and our commitment is that when we find new knowledge that can be applied, we do it full steam. And in, in that regard, over the last... 10 years, we've had, uh, none of that's written down here, so over the last 10 years, we've initiated over 40 industry and clinical relationships, uh, and that's included uh, uh, Queensland's first and currently only NASDAQ-listed company, which is a new treatment for inflammatory bowel disease, uh, all the way to uh, a partnership with Syngenta, one of the world's large major uh, uh, life sciences company that's in the plant space uh, to the global pharmaceutical giants such as Pfizer. So the impact of our research is felt not only locally in the community but across the world. So as we like to say, our mission is to heal, fuel and feed the world. So tonight you'll hear from our IMB researcher Ben Hankemer and UQ Global Change Institute research researcher Professor Karen Hussey about how tiny microalgae uh, which are over there in the panels, uh, uh, may help us solve some of these major challenges. First of all, we'll hear Karen will uh, we'll paint the challenge that faces us in terms of uh, how our population is expanding and how the entire ecosystem that surrounds us is under stress and how we might meet those challenges. Uh, and that'll be for around 15 minutes. And then Ben will follow for around 25 minutes to tell you about our Centre for Solar uh, Biotechnology and the many applications that that'll find in the community. So let me start by introducing Karen. Karen is the Acting Director of the Global Change Institute at the University of Queensland. Has an amazing background. Uh, was trained as a political scientist and economist, but she's okay. Uh, and Karen's research is in the area of public policy uh, governance and particularly relating to sustainable development uh, to, and had, Karen's been involved in numerous research projects uh, involving uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation, disaster risk reduction and international trade. And just to add another depth to Karen's experience, she was based for some time for four years in Brussels as the ANU Vice Chancellor's representative in Europe and currently holds a number of positions on uh, board appointments in the not for profit sector. So it's with great pleasure I invite Karen up to the stage. Thanks, Karen. Uh, 
Thank you, Brandon. Um, far too kind. Uh, hello, friends, colleagues, um, people I look forward to meeting in about an hour, preferably over a drink. Could I just have a show of hands of who was here three weeks ago for the Donald Trump lecture? Marvellous. I just want to assure you that I do do more than give presentations. Uh, this is my second in a month here. I'm conscious of that. Um, our aim tonight is obviously to explore some of the extraordinary research that's being done uh, at the University of Queensland, particularly in the Institute of Molecular Biology, um, and even within that, uh, in the Centre for Solar Biotechnology. Ben and his team's work is very clearly focused on addressing global challenges, in fact, finding solutions for global challenges. My brief tonight was uh, essentially to introduce you to some of those global challenges. Uh, what is it that we're trying to fix? What is it that we're trying to solve? Uh, and how bad is it? How urgent do we need to be thinking about these things? So in approximately 15 minutes, I'll tell you what's wrong with the world. Uh, but then Ben will get up and tell you what the solution is. Um, so we'll end on a high note. In the first instance, just for a little bit of context, thanks to the third industrial revolution, we now have a global economy uh, that's valued at about 119 trillion US dollars. At the turn of the previous century, in 1900, the global economy was valued at about 1.9 billion US dollars. So in the space of 117 years, we've utterly transformed the way we live, the way we work, and frankly, what we've done with our planet. I'm going to start by introducing you to nine global trends. Some of these trends you'll be familiar with. You'll say, yep, I recognize that. That affects my daily life. Some of them you may not be familiar with. And in fact, in Q&A, I look forward to being challenged on whether or not all nine of them really genuinely are global trends. In the remainder of my presentation, I'm going to focus particularly on global change, environment, sustainability, um, those issues related to a, a trend in rising temperatures. I'm going to focus on population growth and increasing demand for resources, particularly in relation to energy. But before I do that, I want you to really focus on what these nine global trends are. And inevitably, as an academic, I'm going to tell you that they are all complex and interrelated, right? but they really very genuinely are. And, and all of these, the shifting centers of economic activity away from the West and to Asia, shifts in population, not just in terms of size, but in terms of the wealth and the demographic of populations, that has an impact on our resource consumption rates. Things like urbanization and the emer emergence of mega cities, so the biggest city in China, which is Guangzhou, has 44 million inhabitants. Right? Our whole country has a population of 24 million, approximately. Right? So these trends are pre producing pressures. Now, the ones on the right-hand side, being a political scientist, of course, they're the ones that really turn me on. But if you think about evolving values and social norms, the idea that as we've globalized, as people have moved from place to place, as we've seen uh, increasing expectations on the part of wealthier, more informed, more aware populations, we're also seeing things like an expectation that our environment is clean, an expectation that we do take climate change seriously, that we address it now not necessarily global in extent, but certainly a trend that we can start, start to see. So as I talk about specific trends and challenges, I just want you to keep those in mind, uh, and perhaps we'll come back to them in, in Q&A, particularly um, number eight, increasing nationalism. Um, I've got more to say on that, but it's not on topic, uh, so perhaps over a drink. Let me start with world population growth. All of you will be familiar with this. Right? We have a rising population. Conservatively, we might be thinking about a 7.2 billion dollar, 7.2 billion person population. What am I saying? 7.2 billion people um, by 2100. 
uh, now, or an increase to 9.6 billion or 12.3 billion in a worst case scenario by 2100. So 12.3 billion people between now and the end of this century. Okay. Worst case scenario. How they, how they project this, of course, is based on uh, mortality rates, fertility rates, and the like. Uh, and that, in turn, of course, is a consequence of economic growth and welfare. But this one, I think, is particularly interesting, and I hope you can see it. So this is population projections basically from now until the end of this century. Oceania, Europe, North America, pretty much stable between now and the end of the century. But the real humdingers are obviously Africa and China. So if we have about 12 billion people on the planet by the end of this century, we can expect about two thirds of them to be in Africa and Asia. Two thirds of the world's population in Africa and Asia. That's an extraordinary turnaround on 115 years ago. This one again is interesting because population of course is not just a function of growth but it's also where are those people going to be and how much moving are they going to do. And We know from this uh, kind of analysis, what's interesting in this kind of analysis is that we see enormous migration within countries. So while we can expect to see some migration from one region to another, there's going to be increasing migration within countries and within uh, smaller sub-regions. Okay. But all of that, frankly, after you get sort of beyond 10 years from now, it can be a little hard to, to be certain about. I think, I think one of the things we need to, to sort of really understand as a population is What's driving the type of negative challenges that we're seeing now in relation to uh, greenhouse gas emissions, water scarcity, an absence of hygiene and sanitation in some communities? Right? And all of that is being driven essentially by consumption or unsustainable production. Right? Now, I wanted to show you this, not because I'm interested necessarily in individual graphs, but because the trajectory is pretty clear for every single one of them. All of these are going up, whether we're talking about population, total real GDP, foreign direct investment, urban population, paper consumption, the number of McDonald's restaurants on the planet, the number of motor vehicles being used, the number of telephones being bought, international tourism, short-term mobility of people, usually through uh, the use of aircraft, damming rivers, one of particular interest of mine, and water use. So every single one of these indicators, and they're a random collection of indicators, no doubt, but every single one of these speaks to the notion of global change. We are using more, and ultimately we're using energy to produce or to feed that consumption. There's hardly an indicator out there that isn't rising sharply and hasn't been rising sharply essentially for the last century. So if you ever wonder about whether what you feel is happening is actually happening, you know, are we busier now? Are we using more? Is the rest of the world using as much as we are? Yes, they are, well and truly. Now, in terms of what this means from an energy perspective, this is some of the work done um, by colleagues of ours. And essentially, if we take our key variables of population growth based on UN forecasts, our average energy use per person, so per capita energy use, and economic growth, what we find is that th the three variables are very tightly intertwined. Okay. Now, you could argue that energy efficiency is the answer. Sure, we can have more people on the planet as long as we use energy more efficiently. But all the re research out there shows that we might be more efficient in one part of our lives, but with that freed up cash, we go and buy more of something else. So we don't actually net get a net gain when we focus exclusively on energy efficiency. One of the take home messages from this graph is that 
This relationship between per capita energy use, population growth, and economic growth still allows for the fact that 50% of the world's population lives on less than $2.50 per day. And in fact, it's based on data which uses 2.5% as average GDP growth, which is actually at the lower end. So if we take into account China and India and their percentage growth over time, we're actually seeing energy go right up. And if we want to be able to adopt an equitable or a, a, a justice framework to this kind of conversation, we need to think about that green line. Right? That's just allowing for the fact that 50% of the population is wealthy. What about if the other 50% decide that they want to be wealthy like us too. And arguably, they have a right to be. When you work with Ben, you end up with an awful lot of graphs, I've discovered. What I want to draw your attention to here is essentially that bottom yellow quartile. And that speaks to how urgently we're going to need to address greenhouse gas emissions and the need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions if we're to provide for energy growth to sustain, or not just sustain, but to improve welfare in the whole world's population. So that bottom 50%. If we include that bottom 50% in our projections, it means that we've actually got to use, to reduce rather, our greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2020. Right? So in two and a half years, we're going to have to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 50%. Clearly, we're not going to do that. Arguably, we're not going to reduce them uh, by 2030 either by that much. And are we seeing any kind of trend in relation to increases in global average temperatures already? Well, yes, we are. And that's what the two fancy looking circles on the right tell you. So essentially, and I'm not sure how well it's come up, but the inner circle is 1.5 degrees global temperature change, and the outer ring is 2 degrees. So in 2016, we're already butting up against 1.5 degrees Celsius increase in global average temperatures. Now, I had this conversation with my mother, and she said, sure, what does it matter, Karen? 1.5 degrees. And I said, no, 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 Mum, you've got to think about it like this. If we go to 1.5 degrees, an increase in 1.5 degrees of global average temperature, you can add another 14 degrees approximately on to every 40 degree day that you're going to have. Right? So you might have more 40 degree days, which of course hits older people and young people, but so too we might end up exacerbating it by having 54 degree days. So Australians end up living like Saudi Arabians. No offence to Saudi Arabia. So what does all of this add up to? These global challenges mean that we've got to have 70% more food by 2050, according to the UN. We've got to have 50% more fresh water by 2050. We've got to have 50% more fuel by 2050. And we're going to need more chemical feedstocks in order to feed those people. And while we're busy doing that, we've also got to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions so that we don't go beyond 1.5 or, frankly, 2, 2 degrees. Okay. If we don't achieve this, we can expect far more conflicts than we've seen in the past. And there's quite a bit of evidence now to suggest that the Arab Spring that we saw emerge not even a decade ago was a consequence of concurrent droughts in countries that produce uh, staple products like wheat, including Australia, in the millennium drought. So if we think we have resource scarcity and conflicts now, if we go to two degrees or more, those red regions uh, get more serious. Uh, we're red. Why are we red? Anybody want to shout out the reason? What? Yep, yep, dry as continent, conflict through the Murray-Darling Basin. To the extent that we can manage this kind of stress, it's about institutional capacity. 
And clearly, if you have a high level of institutional capacity like we do, we're probably going to be okay up to a point. Right? But it just, this just speaks to the fact that we really need to get ourselves uh, into gear to act urgently, or we'll find we're not just dealing with resource scarcity, we're dealing with conflict. The planetary boundaries idea Ben is going to come back to in his presentation, but I wanted to put it up here just to show you that the scientific community has thought long and hard about what this means. And essentially they've said there are parameters within which human beings and other species can live safely. And if we exceed those thresholds or those parameters, bad stuff happens. And we're already exceeding it in relation to the loss of um, species, in relation to greenhouse gas emissions and stable climates. But we have a, a scorecard, right? and we need to keep an eye on it. I'll leave you with this because it leads in to Ben's presentation. Essentially, there's an enormous amount of uh, awareness, I think, particularly amongst Australians, about the PV solution to our electricity sector. Right? We need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in our electricity sector. Thankfully, we have PV, we've got wind. Apparently, we're going to use more hydro. Um, what we don't tend to focus on is the fuel part of the equation. Right? What are we going to do in order to meet greenhouse gas emission reductions in relation to fuel, which is an enormous part of the equation? It's the 80-20 rule. Right? Ben will tell you, compellingly, in 25 minutes, not like me, I've gone over time, that algae and the use of essentially clever technologies that learn from life is going to be one of the solutions. And in fact, there's eight particular solutions that speak very clearly to that 80% challenge. How do we actually fuel our economy in a way that reduces our greenhouse gas emissions, that provides clean water, sustainable food production systems, and urban, or urban environments that are sustainable for all those mega cities. Over to you, Ben. Solve the problem now. Thank you, Karen. Well done. You've laid the background out for us beautifully, so I won't have to go over it again except to introduce uh, Professor Ben Hankamer, who is the Foundation Director of the IMB Centre for Solar, Bi Solar Biotechnology. Ben was trained in Liverpool, then the University of London and Imperial College London, and after his stint at Imperial, uh, one of the world's top five universities, uh, we were lucky enough to bring him here to Queensland, uh, where he embarked upon the research program you're going to hear a little or in detail about now. Uh, the final thing about Ben is that he's consistently held competitive research grants from a number of uh, Commonwealth and, and external agencies. He was an, a, an Australian Research Council DORA Fellow in a year when he was the only such senior uh, ARC Fellow awarded at the University of Queensland. And interestingly, he was also an Eisenhower Fellow, which is a travelling, a very prestigious travelling fellowship. To my knowledge, there have only been three Queenslanders who have ever been awarded an Eisenhower Fellow. One was another IMB uh, uh, professor, Melissa Little, uh, Ben, and Sir Leo Hilscher, as a long-time and term treasurer of the, universe, uh, of the state of Queensland, and many of you may drive over the Sir Leo Hilscher bridges to cross the river on a daily basis. So Ben's in absolutely stellar company. So I'd like to introduce Professor Ben Hankamer. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Karen, for setting the scene and to the organizers for providing this opportunity. So Karen just uh, presented to you the issue of planetary boundaries that we face. And so I thought I'd start off with this slide of our world. And the fact that we had a $119 trillion economy was just covered. It's powered by a $6 trillion energy sector. And that is largely based on fossil fuels. And really, now we're faced with the fact that we have to transition to a renewable future because we have to reduce our emissions by 50% in the next 3 to 13 years, as you've just heard. And that's the bad news. The good news is that the sun provides us with over 5,000 times more energy than we need to power the entire economy every year. And we can use it 
through photovoltaic systems to produce electricity, and that's that 20% of the, elect of the energy market. We can use it for the production of fuels. It's challenging. I won't pretend it's easy. But we can also use it for a third category, and that is solar-powered industries, and that's something I want to touch on today as well. So if you think of the world and you look at those green spots that I have up there on the map, those are really the photosynthetic interfaces. So our planet has evolved photosynthesis over three billion years to catch sunlight and use that to power our planet. And typically, we think of trees and forests, and we look at the canopies and the amazing structures that we see in our forests. But what we often don't think about is all the other photosynthetic organisms in water, for example, microalgae. So here you see a picture of these single-celled microalgae. There's a whole range of different structures and shapes, geometries of, of microalgae which have evolved to fill different ecological niches. And we can use those for a whole range of biotechnologies. And so recently we formed the Center for Solar Biotechnology. And it's really focused on harnessing the power of the sun using microalgae and ultimately also artificial bio-inspired systems. And so what the center is designed to do is to connect about 30 national and international teams and our industry partners to fast track the development of sustainable solar powered bioeconomies. And by the bioeconomy, I mean an economy that's based on biology, the ability to grow crops as part of a bioeconomy, using organisms to treat water as part of a bioeconomy and those bioservices that we have. And so, as Karen pointed out, we have now eight programs, one on clean water, one on aquaculture and livestock feeds, uh, functional foods, protein therapeutics. Now, you may not know what I mean about that, but if you think about the use of insulin for diabetes treatment, imagine producing insulin in algae, or imagine having drugs which are provided as algae tablets. That's kind of the protein therapeutic space that we're looking at. Also solar fuels, which we'll come to uh, towards the end, and integrating these technologies into advanced production systems, into green smart cities, and growing roads programs. So I'm gonna to touch briefly on each of those. So we're headquartered at the IMB, as Brandon already mentioned, and we have also established one of the most advanced pilot plants in the country for using and developing microalgae systems. And if you think of each algae cell, it in itself is a small cell factory. It captures solar energy, it captures CO2 and water and nutrients, and it produces biomass from which you can make all these various products. And it also releases the atmospheric oxygen that we need to survive. Other advantages of microalgae systems are the fact that we can locate them on non-arable land and that we can produce a lot of microalgae strains with saline water or wastewater systems. So when you think about trees and how they've evolved, they've got really quite optimized 3D structures. They have large branches and leaves to distribute thin leaves to catch the light. They have also thin leaves to allow you to uh, absorb CO2 and to release oxygen. And they've got root systems to absorb the water and the nutrients. And on the bottom of that picture, you can see those sort of uh, brown leaves there, typical of Europe where I originally came from. Uh, where you have a lot of the wastes dropping down in the form of leaves. And when you think of bioreactors for the production of microalgae, they have to do all of those things, and we have to do so cheaply. So I'm going to show you a short video of the pilot plant out in Pinjara Hills to show you how we use that for the design of systems, about a minute long. So we're really excited that we've, we've opened the Solar Biofuels Research Center. It is one of the most advanced plants for microalgae production in Australia and what we've tried to put together is an excellent team and excellent equipment to do high quality research. The reason we started off this project was that uh, we are now 7 billion people approximately and we're moving to 9 billion people and all of us will require more food and more fuel, more chemical feedstocks and fresh water and so what this project is about is taking algae, take sunlight and CO2 and combine it to make biomass, so the, the, the product that we make from the algae. And from this you can extract oils for the production of aviation fuels or biodiesel. You can take the biomass and you can convert that into uh, methane through fermentation. In some cases you can extract the carbohydrates for ethanol production or we also have strains which uh, convert water to hydrogen using sunlight. 
the most fundamental thing is improving the biomass productivity and that's what this project is about, is how do we maximise the light energy that we get in here into chemical energy in the form of biomass. So there's a multiple set of systems that we could use and test and it would take us a very long time and a lot of money to test them all. And so what I wanted to do is to show you some of these various systems and we need to identify the best and optimise them further. So here, for example, is an open pond type structure which is being used for beta carotene production and hence the red colour. You can see these uh, high rate raceway ponds that are used for pumping algal solutions around. You can get flat panel systems which improve the ability to distribute light through the system. And then people developed water filled bags which support these structures to try and reduce the cost. Or you can integrate them into greenhouse structures for high value product production. If you want to increase the surface area further, you can go to tubular systems. And so you can see there's a whole range of these systems that we can use and we have to find which are the best ones for our purpose. And to evaluate this, we developed a software program, by, uh, particularly by Evan Stevens and John Rolls in our group, to look at the testing of systems. And what it does is it's got databases of strains, it's got databases of different production systems, and also databases of uh, harvesting and downstream processing systems. And some systems are ridiculous and will never work, and some will. And it's about trying to combine the best systems so that we can optimize the profitability, we can improve the energy that we get out of the system, and we can reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And through this process, it helps us to fast track that systems optimization, which is really important given the fact we have so little time to do it. What we try and do is use this modeling work to guide our design and to work down that cost curve from high value products to fuels and to increase the efficiency and cost of the processes. So let me show you a couple of these areas that we look at. Clean water, for example. You can use it for treating agricultural wastewater, livestock wastewater, industrial wastewater, for the protection of the Great Barrier Reef, which I'll come to in a minute, and municipal wastewater. So a whole range of nutrient supplies that we can extract using algae. So the Australian federal government and Queensland government have uh, prepared the Reef 2050 long-term sustainability plan. And they've identified the fact that we need to reduce our runoff in terms of sediment by 50% and our nitrogen runoff by 80% by 2025. And there's not too many solutions to do that. So if you think about, for example, a sugarcane field where the water, the excess is running off with nutrient rich water during a storm, you can catch that using algae systems. And so with our industry partners, we're looking to do that. You can also produce nitrogen fixing microalgae. So they actually absorb nitrogen out of the atmosphere and put that nitrogen back in the soil without the need for chemical fertilizer. And as Karen pointed out, that's one of the planetary boundaries that, face, that we face. And so this way we can improve crop production, hopefully reduce the input requirements and protect the reef, which as we know is under severe stress also through climate change. If we look at mines tailings dams, they're often quite polluted water sources. Again, nutrients can be extracted where they're available. And sometimes you can use the process of phyto mining, i.e. plant mining, where you use plants to extract certain elements, which you then recover in the biomass. From a wastewater treatment approach, Algae absorb the nutrients, but also produce oxygen to oxygenate the water. And so there are now a series of industry uh, groups that are developing microalgae water treatment systems. From the aquaculture and livestock feeds perspective, perspective this is about a, the, this, uh, these industries are worth $21 billion in, in Australia. And so the production of algae feeds would allow us to improve livestock feed security, to help drought proof, to protect wild caught fish stocks, stocks because we can improve on the aquaculture side of things, support regional development and sustainable jobs, which also comes back to Karen's point about the issue of Trump and Brexit and disadvantage. Other things that are perhaps of even higher value are functional foods. So you can use algae for the production of foods containing health giving additives, for example, antioxidants, you can use a range of different algae-based health foods that you can already get in, uh, in the pharmacy. Uh, health drinks and omega-3 oils, which you can produce. In terms of value, you can also go a step higher in terms of protein therapeutics. If you think about a drug that you take, and supposing you have one milligram 
for a dose, and it's a dollar for a dose, that's a million dollars a kilogram of product. So if you're able to produce a kilogram of those proteins, that's already a million dollar value product. Of course, it's not the total value because you have all the manufacturing, but you can see that there's some high value opportunities. Now, UQ has great strength in areas of new, uh, neuropharmaceuticals, pain treatment, for example, stroke, epilepsy, dementia, also in antibiotic development and in vaccine development. And so we're teaming up with these groups to look at the production of these proteins that they require for their treatments in algae. And that is the basis for the developing of a high value solar powered industry. And so that's a way of working down that cost curve towards fuels. Now fuels are tough, but the point I make to people is, if you've got a better solution, go do it. But at the moment, I can't think of one. And so despite the fact that it's tough, we actually have to try and work down that cost curve. Algae have the advantage that they absorb sunlight and CO2, and they can make a range of fuels like diesel and methane and ethanol and hydrogen. So it's a very versatile base for fuel production. And we see that there is a lot of benefit in terms of going down the electric car route, but we're still going to need fuels for long distance transport, for mining, for planes, for ships and for trains. Also, for baseload, there, baseload power provision is an interesting area. Currently, we're looking at batteries and storing electricity for, through batteries, but you can actually store energy and fuel and use that to feed back in through baseload. So battery costs are also not that cheap, and we have to look at the techno-economics of the value of those things, both for algae systems and artificial systems. So artificial systems, I've put up an image there of a solar panel, but I want you to sort of imagine that that's coated with a catalyst which can split water to generate hydrogen using the power of the sun. And that's where it's heading. So people are developing those technologies. And ultimately, that kind of hydrogen can be used for something like this solar, this hydrogen-driven car, which could show you a very short clip from ABC Catalyst. Now, this is obviously only on a small scale, but the principle is clear. Ben's algae really can produce hydrogen using only sunlight, and that hydrogen is pure enough to generate energy from a fuel cell. So there's work to do, and there's always going to be skeptical people who say, can this be done? And it's a valid question, it's tough. So let's look at some of those constraints. So one question I recently got is, have we got enough land area in Australia? And I almost had to laugh, but yes, the answer is yes, but we can just work that out. So this little red square, which is probably a little hard to see, is 113 by 113 kilometers. This is the area we need with current technologies to provide all petroleum demand for Australia. I was told by a colleague of mine, Megan Sorowski, who's here this evening, that we have 4 million hectares instead of the 1.3 we need, covered by prickly pear. So there is sufficiently sufficient uh, land there to do this. This square here that I've shown you represents that 100, 113 by 113 kilometers. And it's the distance roughly from Brisbane to Umundi. And while that might seem big, if you develop that into 100 separate farms, it's really not that big. This can be distributed around the country. In terms of solar energy, we've already said we have plenty of solar energy to power this. Photosynthetic radiation is 32 times the amount that we need to power the entire planet. That's what we get in Australia. In terms of seawater, we have a large coastline. You can see from the area for the fuel here that I've talked about for fuel production that there's certainly plenty of coastline to be able to use for fuel production if we need that. Also saline aquifers and wastewater. Australia has a significant number of concentrated carbon dioxide streams that we can currently tap into and CSIRO are developing technologies to absorb CO2 from the atmosphere. So the benefits of these technologies include many. We have high value markets that we can develop the technology down from to fuels, down that cost curve. Doing the calculations on this just for the fuel component would provide about 60,000 direct jobs and 27,000 construction jobs. And that could significantly reduce unemployment, providing savings to our budget. In terms of regional development, we have the opportunity to provide high value products, foods, fuels, and water. And in terms of balance of payments, we import about $35 billion worth of petroleum products from Singapore every year and internationally. Imagine if we produced that here. What would that do for our balance of budget? Never mind the fuel security and that we currently have issues with, with methane production and power, power supply and baseload. And it also helps us with our climate change obligations. 
So, this is the one technical slide that I put in here. The rest are pretty pictures towards the end, okay? So the government people will say to me, most probably, that what we need to see from you is economic benefit, we need to see social benefit, and we need to see an environmental benefit. And that, those three variables are represented by this cube. And the economic benefit here is the fuel price and that dropping. The social benefit is increasing the amount of energy we get out of the system because we need energy to provide our society with. And this environmental benefit is the fact that we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So if we're here where that red arrow is, we need to get down to that green arrow in the bottom corner. And if we can do that, then we've got down to 80 cents a litre of diesel. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to throw out a challenge to our government colleagues here and say this is only policy except for the very first step. We have to obviously do our bit on the R&D. And we need to drive down, our, our improve our efficiencies. But already people are producing biomass at 30 grams per meter squared a day. The Department of Energy works on 14.6. So that would get us here if we do that on, a, on an annual basis. If we transfer this technology to China, we would have lower wages and it would take us to here. Now, we don't want to do that. We want to create the jobs here. So we need to put in a degree of automation. If we applied a carbon tax of $55 a ton, then we would get down to here. If we got cheaper electrical power to power our plants, which is very likely given the way costs are coming down with PV, we would get to there. And if we were able to borrow money through the Clean Energy Finance Corporation for work like this instead of on the open market and get the new tax rate for business, which was just approved in the last budget, we would get to there. And if we thought about this as a non-for-profit to say that we actually just want to make the fuel we need and provide the jobs without making a profit, but take people out of unemployment and provide social good, it would take us down to there. This would provide you with a path to 80 cents a litre for biodiesel, based on our best modelling that we have at the moment. If we added solar panels onto our algae plants to power the plant, it would take us into the blue box where we want to be. So while we work on the R&D, we need government to be focusing on the policy to work down that path towards a solar-powered industry. And the question really is, then, are we going to do this here or is it going to happen somewhere else? Because I'm convinced it's going to happen somewhere. I don't know whether we will do all the fuels, but there's certainly all the high-value products that we talked about before. The Integrated Bioeconomy Project is a project where we integrate technologies into advanced greenhouses through materials, thin film photovoltaics to catch infrared radiation, which is heat load on the greenhouse. We put in heat exchange systems so that we stabilize the temperature and can increase the product range. We increase CO2 enrichment in the greenhouse for increased productivity, try and purify water using solar technologies already being done, I'll show you in a minute. Integrate bio, microbiome technologies to improve the quality of the soils. Introduce 3D production systems, automation, looking at the integration of different crops and putting algae systems into there too for really high value products. We need to integrate all those things into these greenhouses, and that's what the Integrated Bioeconomy Project's about. Evaluating them techno-economically and life cycle based and take the best systems and put them together. This is the basis of what we're trying to do through a $25 million project, should we get that support. Why do we need to do it? If you look at this picture here, it's a picture of current agriculture. You can see where the water is provided for agriculture and where it isn't. You can see the difference. And um, I was provided with this picture with one of my colleagues. And if you zoom in on this bottom part of Spain, of the map of Spain, you can see a white region down here and if you zoom into that, it looks like this. It's covered in greenhouses where people are already covering areas to improve the efficiency of production. Also in Australia, an organization called Sundrop is using seawater, solar distillation to produce tomatoes and greenhouses and start to produce on non-arable land. So it allows us to produce next generation protected cropping systems, stable temperatures and humidity, more food and less water, and support field crop development. Support sustainable industry development and support regional jobs creation. The last two programs, which I'll skip through very quickly, focus on green smart cities. These are more visionary at the moment, but 
they could well happen. We look at rabbit urbanization, sustainable cities are going to be needed, and we want them to be attractive and functional. And so people are developing different designs to integrate green technologies and living spaces into cities. In Singapore here, you can see these amazing super trees where you can see the trees here and the super tree structures here where they plant plants up the surface. What about doing things like that? This is an artistic thing, which is beautiful. But it also is a way, a segue into looking at using algal technologies in, in buildings. Here in Germany, for example, they're looking at exactly that. Why? Because the algae increase the thermal mass of the building, stabilizing temperature. They can provide shade. They can produce a degree of fuel. They can abate street noise through the design and regreen the cities. May not be the most practical solution yet, but it's certainly things that people are looking at. And Karen mentioned Chinese cities with 44 million people. Green space might be a nice thing. But we also don't want to encroach on our current wildlife. And so we've also looked at growing roads programs where instead of using noise barriers, what about if we use completely different systems? Like these algae type constructions along the sides of roads. So we're trying to do initiation of modeling, techno-economic, to see what the value of such things is and whether it would be workable. But also, if you look at, many of you will know the Legacy Way and that smokestack, which is in the Botanic Garden. If you don't know it, next time you drive past, have a look. What about using that structure to absorb the carbon dioxide from here and wrap algae systems around there and couple the botanic knowledge in the Botanic Gardens with environmental outcomes in terms of transport? Or regreening infrastructure, such as here or here. So, finishing with the planetary boundaries that Karen came up with, I put a little color-coded dot on the next to each of our different programs. And you can see that many of these start to target these areas. Now, I'm not claiming that we have magic solutions that will solve all the problems, but it is a way that we can start working there. And Australia is really well placed to do that, and we should be. And so, if you want to get involved and you're an entrepreneur, then get in touch with us and work with us. If you're an industry colleague, then work with us as partners in R&D and developing value chains. If you're in government, work with us for policy development and impact investment. And if you're a student, come and work with us, get project experience and work experience. In education, we're happy to come out to schools and do demonstrations and provide some insights for the technologies and help with community outreach. If you're involved in philanthropy, help us develop these technologies. We'd be grateful. And finally, for the community, we're very happy to come out and visit and work with you and present in public. Finally, I'll finish with thanking our industry partners, who have been many, and we've been very grateful for the support, our international colleagues, my wonderful team, without whom nothing would be possible. And I've highlighted some of the postdocs of my team here who will be over here together with the students to show the demonstration so that we can welcome you to our biofuture. Thank you very much.